when we look at specifically the eschatological uh, vision of what Jesus does, what Muslims believe Jesus will do at the end of the age, Jesus comes back, according to Islamic sacred tradition, as a Muslim. He comes back to tell the Christians of the world, you have had it wrong all along. Been deceived. You've been deceived. Lied to. When I was here on earth, I was a Muslim prophet. Your scriptures have been completely distorted. I never claimed to be the divine son of God. I never claimed to be, uh, you know, uh, I, I never died on the cross. Muslims do not believe that Jesus died on the cross. So they deny they the They don't believe in, Christ, in Jesus as the son of God because they claim being a monotheistic belief system that there cannot be a son of God. Is that correct? Yeah, Muslims have a distorted understanding of what we teach. They say God is not a man that he would have a child, like in the natural sense, to which we would agree God is not a man. Nevertheless, the idea of God the Son, or you could say the Word of God, is from a biblical perspective, the idea that God himself stepped into creation. He took on flesh. He condescended. Muslims would disagree. God is great. God does not lower himself. Right. Yeah. And this is essential because the difference between the God of Islam and the God of the Bible is that the God of Islam says he is too great to lower himself on our behalf. The God of the Bible says, I made myself a servant to all, and I even embraced suffering and death on a cross because I am a father and I love my children. I love them this much. That's what makes our faith so superior emotionally and in every way our concept of God is appealing on every level. The God of Islam is vacant, he is distant, and he is uh, you know, emotionally unavailable. I interrupted you. You were focusing in on their view of Christ, our view of Christ, of Jesus. Sure. So when Jesus comes back, he tells the Christians of the earth, you've had it wrong all along, your scriptures have been corrupted, Islam is the true religion, and the Mahdi, the Islamic Messiah figure, you need to follow him. Islam is the true religion, he is the Mahdi, he is the, uh, he is the leader of the Islamic world, follow him. So he, Jesus, in their view, is actually pointing them now to their long-awaited for Messiah. Exactly. Yeah, okay. So now, to bring uh, this not up. Not the Savior of mankind, not the Redeemer, but he is now pointing them to their Messiah. Okay. And this is what's so interesting with regard to biblical prophecy. In Revelation 13, the Bible says that there'll be the Antichrist, the beast. The beast also has an assistant. The Bible calls him the false prophet. The false prophet points to the Antichrist, and it says that he works wonders and miracles in order to get the inhabitants of the earth to follow the beast. Okay? In Islamic eschatology, you have the, the Mahdi, and then you have the Isa al-Masih, that's Jesus the Messiah in Arabic. You have this false Muslim Jesus that says, follow the Mahdi. In Revelation 13, it says of the false prophet, it says he has two horns like a ram, i.e. like a lamb, the ram of God that takes away the sins of the world is the actual uh, language in the Greek. It says he appears to be like a ram or a lamb, but he speaks like a dragon. It's very similar to the warning that Jesus told us. He said, beware of false prophets. They come to you as wolves in sheep's clothing. Here you have a dragon in sheep's clothing. It's, it's the exact same picture. Instead of a wolf, it's a dragon. He appears to be the lamb of God. He is actually a demonic being pointing the people of the earth to follow the beast, the Antichrist. Joel, I find this extremely fascinating. And again, uh, we're going to be encouraging people to uh, get a hold of this book and read it uh, at the end of the broadcast, and we're going to bring your website information up. But I want to ask you this. Um, in some respects, your book can create a firestorm for Joel Richardson from all sides of the belief camps. Um, you can very easily tick off the Muslim world with what you're saying here, and what you are indicating here flies in the face of much of what we hear today as standard biblical prophecy. So my question is this, 
what was Joe Richardson's goal in writing this book as it relates first to the Christian community and secondly to the Muslim community? What were your motivations and your goal? Thank you. First of all, to the Christian community, my heart is that they would wake up to the greatest challenge that the church will ever face before the return of the Messiah the church will be turned over in one final glorious uh, opportunity to bear witness to the world we will be given the opportunity to embrace the cross to embrace martyrdom and bear witness to the world of the reality of the kingdom to come the messianic kingdom that Jesus will be bringing and Islam will be the primary vehicle of that uh, martyrdom the church is in denial uh, on the charismatic side uh, we cling to dominionism and testimonies and we uh, oftentimes over exaggerate some of the wonderful stories that are coming in from the missionary field and, and we act as though the entire Islamic world is going to convert in the next few years from the dispensational perspective the church is trying to uh, misinterpret Ezekiel 38 and 39 claiming that the entire Islamic world is just going to be wiped out in a battle someday soon and rendered irrelevant that Islam will just go away Islam is not going away the church needs to wake up needs to be prepared not only to be prepared themselves but also to reach Muslims missionally we need to recognize this as the greatest challenge as far as Muslims go my heart for Muslims and I tried to temper this book. It's a critical book. It's a polemic. I tried to temper it with love for Muslims. My heart is that they would see this final cosmic conflict. They would see the final battle and they would recognize that they've been deceived. They have been set up. There is a father God that loves them. He has a son. He is coming back to judge the earth. And those that come against his people Israel will be judged. Absolutely. It's clear throughout the writings of the prophets. They're following the wrong prophet. Muhammad is not a true prophet. He is not uh, the final apostle of God. Jesus is the final messenger of God, if you will. And, uh, and he's the one. The Jesus of the Bible is the, the one that the Muslims of the world need to be following. Uh, as it says in Psalm 2, kiss the son, lest he be angry. So your motivation is, one, to awaken the church. And on the other hand, to the Muslim community, to sound forth a trumpet, Joel's trumpet, <laughs> um, as it relates to the truth, as it relates to uh, belief systems. Um, Joel, you referenced... Uh, dispensational thought as it relates particularly to Ezekiel. Uh, Gog, Magog, you do some very interesting things in your book as it relates to the interpretation of Gog and Magog. Speak to that briefly and then before our broadcast ends, I'm going to invite you and ask you to look into a camera and to lead men and women, uh, those who don't know Christ, Muslims, others, to saving faith in Jesus Christ. But speak to the issue of Gog, Magog, because everyone who is embracing a dispensational belief in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church uh, has a, a very concrete view of Gog and Magog. Speak to that for just a moment. Okay, well, first of all, all the prophets throughout the Bible are basically telling the same story. End of the age, charismatic military religious leader gathers a coalition, they invade the land of Israel, Messiah returns, defeats them. Same story. Ezekiel's telling the same story. Dispensationalists often begin with this idea that the Antichrist is going to come out of Europe based on a misinterpretation of Daniel 2, Daniel 9.26. They then take that those two passages and their misinterpretation of them impose that false interpretation onto all these other passages. They come to Ezekiel 38. They go, these are clearly Middle Eastern nations. They go, this must be a different charismatic military religious political leader. This must be a different massive invasion of Israel. Here's the problem with that. It says clearly in the passage that at the time of the defeat of Gog Magog, it says from this day forward, I will no longer allow my name to be blasphemed. All the nations will know that I am Yahweh, the God of Israel. Israel will know that I'm the God of, of Israel. And yet, dispensationalists teach that Gog Magog is destroyed several years before the coming of the Antichrist, 
who brings up the greatest blasphemy movement the world has ever known. So it doesn't make sense. And then God says, O oh Gog, are not you the one that I've been speaking of by all of my former prophets? If that's the case, we can look at the prophets. They're all talking about the Antichrist. But all those who say that Gog is a different guy, they can't point to a single verse in any of the other prophets and say, this is Gog, not the Antichrist. The bottom line is, it doesn't make sense. It's the same story. They're all telling the same story. It's pointing us to the Middle East. Um, I, like you, have been to Jerusalem, to Israel many times. Uh, I have visited the Dome of the Rock. Uh, in Islamic writings, uh, the Dome of the Rock, as it relates to uh, their coming Messiah, plays a very significant role. Speak to that for just a moment, and then we're going to go to prayer. Okay. Well, I just I find it personally more than just coincidental or ironic that the very seat where the temple sat, where the, 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 the footstool of God, where he would rule over the nations with an iron scepter, where the, the yearning of the Jewish people for generations looked to this place where Jesus the Messiah came, where he will rule over the nations, that very location is now a monument built by the Muslims and encircling the inside of that are the Arabic words God has no son. It's a monument of defiance to the reality of the coming rule of the Messiah. I say that's more than just a strange coincidence. Very good. Joel, would you take a minute? I want to again thank you for being here and we're going to uh, let our audience know how they can secure your book. But would you take a moment and look into that camera, and would you invite those who have been in our listening audience? Uh, you have began your journey uh, desiring to touch people like yourself who have a genuine hunger for truth, a genuine hunger for God. Would you invite those in our audience to receive Christ as their Savior and Lord? Amen. Father, I thank you for everyone that is uh, listening and watching this broadcast. Father, I ask for your followers that you would empower them to see your son as the one that came to make himself a servant of all, that they would be emboldened to love those that they understand to be their enemies, that they would be like your son, they would make themselves a servant of all. And for the Muslims of the earth, Father, I ask that you would do for them what you did for us, that you would open their eyes, that you would help them to see the deception that is Islam, that you would help them to see the truth of the Bible, the reality of who you are, that you, the Almighty God, came down because you love us as a father. I ask that you would reach into the Islamic world, awaken Muslims with dreams and visions, that you would empower the missionaries to be bold in all that they do, we thank you for these things in the name of Jesus. Joel, the uniqueness of Christ. He's your Savior. He's your Lord. He's your soon-coming King. If you had to leave our audience with anything interesting as it relates to the uniqueness of Christ, what would you say about Christ? Well, again, the God of Islam is the God that refuses to condescend. He is not a father. The God of the Bible is the God that comes down and becomes flesh and dwells among us, and not just dwells among us, that he embraces the cross, that the Almighty God makes himself a servant of all. We live in a world where everyone's trying to put themselves at the top of the pyramid and lord it over everyone under them. The Bible calls us to live in a complete reversed way, and on the day of the Lord, the needy, the forgotten, the victimized, the oppressed, they're exalted. And those that have exalted themselves and put themselves at the top of the pyramid will be humiliated and humbled. And Jesus is the one that initiates that great reversal. So he is, his heart is for the poor. And so I would appeal to everyone that's watching this, humble yourself now. Make yourself a servant now. Embrace the attitude that was in Christ. Shortly after you came to Christ, you went to the streets of Boston. And it was there that you began encountering those of the Muslim faith, sharing the love of Christ with them. 